to jump right in with some thoughts about how some of these presentations are connected, but I wanted to um, drill down a little bit more, uh, Yo-Yo, on this concept of the relationship between the margins and the center, or your metaphor, the scout on the margins. Uh, now, if you can illustrate what this scout is, because I see that scout role is like a leader, is a type of leadership, to be honest with you. And I see myself as a, as a scout. And I sometimes describe myself as somebody who's invisibly productive because I have been historically marginalized. So on the margins, I've been able to probably get more done because I'm often relegated to the outside. So while they're not paying attention, uh, I am gathering my community of people that I do trust and we are very productive. And so I see all of us probably uh, working in this kind of way uh, or have been um, before we became hyper visible um, and very much so function at the center. But I want to hear your thoughts about this idea of invisibly productive, the, the work of the scout. Maybe this is the next book we all write this together. But what are, what are your thoughts? And please, other panelists chime in on this idea, your work on the margins, especially Sharon. I mean, you were certainly, um, you know, bringing attention to what's happening to women on the margins as well. And Shalini too, right, with Joy's work. So I, I just, yeah, this is exciting. So I want to hear more. I want to flesh this out a little bit more. Uh, I'll start for 30 seconds and say, you've all been to beaches, public beaches. You first, you go in through the entrance, you have a ton of people on the beach. It's very crowded. You walk a hundred yards away, the crowd thins out. You walk 200 yards away, there's nobody there. You're there, there's less density. That means you have more room to think, you have more room to listen. Dense places, are very noisy. There's a lot of hierarchy. You know, you're close to the seat of power. There's a lot of stuff, people jostling around. There's a, you know, it's it's fine, it's exciting. But, and you know that with any organization, it gets up to a certain point. You're spending a lot of time trying to communicate, making sure everything is going well. The smaller organizations are more nimble. So it's easier to, to um, in some ways, uh, you may be more lonely, but you can also possibly think better. Up to you. Nice. Um, Shalini or Sharon, you wanna jump in here? Yeah. I love the idea of the cat, of the scout, the one that's doing the reconnaissance. Um, they're, the, they're the first to see something. That doesn't necessarily mean they're right, but, but it's something new to chew over. And I, I think that's always good to, to think the same thing all the time. Oh, boring, boring, boring. No, I, I love what... Uh... What has been said of, of, of that meta, metaphor of moving further to the, to the margins so that you can think original thoughts and not be so crowded by the seat of power. And I think that at working as an independent filmmaker, I, I completely relate. And what I want to say is that that is brave territory out there and that you need a lot of support. Oftentimes I liken it to being in the jungle with a machete, <laughs> just trying to make my, my way because uh, oftentimes when you are the first, you are the only, and um, you, you know uh, there's no one like you in the room, you are doing that work. And so I think that those of us who are, are out there on the, in the margins, the scouts, we have to take really good care of ourselves and make sure that we have good support systems um, because it's trying, it's taxing, it's brave, brave work, um, and the world is better for it. 
yeah, I was actually wondering if, if that's the case for you. I mean, do you have your, your community of folks that you can lean on and lean into and, and look to for what I call root juice or, you know, that really important um, emotional, psychosocial, whatever kind of support you need at any one time? Do you have that community? Um, I feel really lucky because I do. Um, I have very close friends and a very close family and they haven't always, not everyone understands what I'm doing. <laughs> My mother being one of them, she still doesn't understand what I'm doing. Um, but I think that um, what's important when so many of us have to perform in situations where we are the first and the only in the room um, that we have spaces where we don't, where we're not that. And also I think when we have to show up as a professional every day in our careers, we need those spaces where we can say this happened to me. Like when I was listening to Sharon talk about the trauma that women have gone through in the sciences, you need a space. Like I, I, I hope that Nancy Hopkins, came home and had a circle of girlfriends that she could have a glass of wine with and say, this is what happened to me at work today. Because when she is at work, she has to show up as a professional and fight the brave fight. And you don't get to bring your emotions to work. And so I think that those spaces, that emotional resilience can't be underestimated because it's necessary um, when you're blazing a trail. Excellent, thank you so much. I'm gonna to turn to the Q&A now. Uh, an anon anonymous attendee has asked us how we can better foster collaboration between the arts and STEM fields in higher education. So thinking specifically about higher ed, uh, this has been on my mind a lot as a professor who, you know, I have a degree in, I have a PhD in philosophy, but my training background is in media theory and I'm a documentary filmmaker. So I'm in all these different, and I work in the sciences. So I spend time in these different spaces, but I see how they are woefully disconnected. And so bridging the divide between the humanities, which seems to me, decades into the future on certain issues and topics, um, even looking at STEM, trying to get STEM to, to think about itself in different kinds of ways. So uh, in the humanities, we've been talking about decolonizing STEM, for example, but then you go into science and they're like, we don't know what this word decolonization even means. Um, I, I'm, you know, I'm being funny here, but, but it's partly true. So how do we, how do we get these different spheres to start talking to each other and work together better? Uh, how do we change the structures even, if possible? Have we thought about that at all? Maybe I wanna to go to Yo-Yo. Have you found yourself um, being invited into these more rigid spaces, STEM spaces to, to get them thinking in different ways? So how do you use your work um, in, you know, in STEM spaces, and I guess this is going to be awful if we can be a little bit brief because we're coming to the end of this, but I'm very curious to hear what, what you have to say about this. Okay, um, two things. I think a liberal arts education teaches us different ways of thinking, that every discipline has a language, right, a frame of thinking from which we then progress. And I think, first of all, uh, in the Enlightenment, natural philosophy was the umbrella over the arts and sciences. More recently, Antonio Damasio wrote uh, Descartes' Error, among other books. Uh, and one of the things he pointed to was rational thinking took over the discussion of who humans and society, the relationship between humans and society. So I'll end with two quotes. The first quote is with Andy Goldsworthy, the artist who works in nature with natural materials. And his quote is, we are part of nature. If we feel disconnected from nature, it's because we're disconnected from ourselves. And the second quote is from Richard Feynman, physicist who said, 
nature has the greatest imagination. But she guards her secrets jealously. So both people claim we're part of nature. And one of the things that we've kind of been put, put aside a little bit is that we focus on humans and society and really human invention as the top of the food chain. Whereas in fact, if we think that we're part of nature, uh, it's still arts and sciences where there are many, the both truths are there. And I think going back to that using that each investigation uses very specific techniques and, and imagination, the hunch, but then we experiment with what we work with in order to find something that is communicable, communicative. Powerful, thank you so much. And uh, you know, as a social philosopher, I could, <laughs> I could get into that so much more, but we don't have a lot of time. So I do wanna encourage our panelists to, if you would like to look through some of the questions here and respond, if you have uh, an interest in particular topics here, you can type responses as well. Um, I, Lydia, how much more time do we have? Because that'll influence how I proceed with um, take, the questions. Uh, we have a 15 minute break scheduled at this time. So you can take up to five. I built that in so that we would have some leeway. Okay, five. Uh, yeah, so more questions about the way that artists and scientists and engineers can work together to solve societal problems. One platform for this has been the Creative uh, Placemaking Initiative as led by Art Place. Okay, so this is really interesting. So bringing artists together with scientists, I'm sure that there are some really interesting models out there, um, perhaps at NSF. I'd be really interested to hear about them. Um, I'm not aware of them at this time, um, but I would love to learn more about that. So if anybody has more information on that, uh, please type them into the answer box. Um, I see the concept of postmodernism. Oh, <laughs> a hard flashbacks from my dissertation as the intersection between creativity, arts, and scouting in the scenes. Yes, exactly. Um, so sometimes being a scout means you are out looking for what could be um, without any knowledge. Yes, exactly. Uh, in music, this reminds me of then new forms of music such as jazz, exactly. Wonderful comment if you wanna to add to that. Um, so lots of thank yous to our panelists and um, more questions about the intersection between the humanities, arts and the sciences. Um, this is probably um, too, too long to get into because now we only have about you know, a couple minutes, um, but a lot of people are interested in this concept, yo-yo, of, of scouts and, and the margins and how to be productive there. So that's really spoken to a lot of people here. Um, another anonymous attendee is asking, could this be where our liberal arts colleges play a role? Actually, you know, I want to talk about NSF here because not just the liberal arts and the colleges, but what can NSF do to you know, start talking about this. And even if you look at the structure of NSF, there, <laughs> there is a silo, you know, a, a silification, is that a word? A segmenting, a disconnect between um, the human focused work and the hard science methodologies and approaches. And I think that we're starting to talk about how these federal agencies are structured because that trickles down to higher ed. So are there any thoughts, and perhaps here, Lydia, you might want to chime in, the funding agencies, are they starting to think about the ways in which they are, are bridging the humanities and the arts with the sciences? Is this happening? It is. Uh, NSF has a long history of supporting uh, films like the ones you've been doing and like Shalini's. They also support uh, uh, writers uh, and other endeavors where the, the arts overlap. 
one of the smallest institute uh, or a division at NSF is the social science division, um, which has increasing gained increasing influence over the past decade or so, because it is folks from those disciplines who really need to uh, interact there, they may provide the bridge between the arts, philosophy, and the natural scientists who tend to be undereducated in these arenas and uninterested because they are undereducated. And so the social scientists who can speak to both languages can help bridge that gap. Um, it's beginning to happen, but it's kind of slow. And so I think we'll see. Uh, hopefully we'll see more of that. And NSF certainly has a role to play, not only at the uh, in higher ed, but they're also quite concerned. The education division is very concerned with the education of K through 12, because if we don't set that kind of foundation in place, then we're already behind the eight ball. And I'm afraid as a country, we are behind the eight ball. That's great. Thank you so much. I did want to ask, uh, and this is just one last comment, I know we have to go, but we did start talking a little bit about uh, science communication. Um, we use the term science communication, but it's really also about transmission of knowledge and knowledges, right? So sometimes I feel like we are not doing it justice by just saying science communication because, you know, people want to put that in a box, but it's about transmission of knowledge and um, and it's culturally distinct too, right? This shows up differently in indigenous spaces versus um, spaces of African heritage. And so um, I just wanted to, I wanted to say that in my research, I've learned that, you know, all people want to participate in STEM in, with the same level of enthusiasm, but probably by the sophomore year of college, for example, um, a lot of folks who are coming from historically marginalized backgrounds decide to leave for whatever reason, they become discouraged, right? And many of us are finding, I know, many of us are finding our way into it through science communication and the humanities. And so it's an interesting thing that you're seeing that numbers are increasing through the humanities. So we're not completely lost um, from the picture. We're just being picked up by, you know, these other fields, the humanities and the arts. So we're sort of reverse engineering our way back into science. So that was my, my capstone comment. Um, but I want to say thank you so much to the participants and the audience and to um, Lydia, but especially the panelists. Thank you for your insights and more, more importantly, for the work that you are doing, um, your significant contributions uh, here in the United States, but worldwide. So thank you again to uh, your your wonderful words. Uh, and um, yes, thanks again for creating this space for this particular conversation. Thanks so much. It was an honor. Thank you. Thank you. It was a great honor. Thank you so much. Thank you.